mental illness and what is not mental illness. Slide. So there are many perspectives throughout the ages of what is and what isn't mental illness by different people. I don't want to get into them very deeply. Um, I just want to mention very briefly that some say you have free will, some say you do not. Uh, some are very philosophical, therefore maybe not considered science. Some are so scientific that they discredit certain features. For example, some models said that we don't have consciousness, um, like behaviorism. Some are very heavily based on sexuality, such as Freudian theories. Uh, some of you may be familiar with them. Uh, many of the models are very philosophical and therefore hard to test. So if they're not science, then unfortunately they're not completely psychology. Still useful, sometimes in the counseling office, because they're often very insightful um, and logically reasoned to some extent. So useful nonetheless. Slide, please. Okay. Now, it would be great to have a perfect, sane human that I could compare other people to. If I want to know what is... Uh, a mental illness, then I need a, an example of mental health. I would have to have a standard to measure so I could know objectively what is mental health and what is mental illness. Um, as far as I know, and I think most psychologists know, there is no perfectly sane person on earth. Um, it would be nice though, and I would say this is where Christ comes in, and we'll talk about this now, which is our very last topic for the introduction. Any questions so far? Yes? No? Okay. Slide, please. So just some brief overview of what Christians consider the reason behind things like mental illness. Um, we draw the source of all suffering from what is called the fall. Simply put, mankind fell away from God, to keep it really simple. Uh, we're not going for a scientific description here. Uh, we're just using religious terms to help us understand what's happening. You might say then, after the fall, uh, the, the relationships between what we call heart, mind, and, and such became broken in a sense. Uh, and what I would like to illustrate is that man fell away from what was the likeness of God. You may have heard that, the image of God, the likeness of God. Man was like God in a sense, um, in so much that he was reasoning and loving and all kinds of things, and he fell away from that. And he fell into a place between the animal kingdom and where he was, a slide. Just a very basic illustration, uh, before the fall, man was, Nick was with God, and in, cre in orthodoxy, we have a very nice hierarchy of creation. We start from you know, very basic life forms, we go all the way up uh, to more complicated life forms, and then when mankind fell, he was in between his original state and the animal kingdom. And what I'd like to put forward is that this is where the, the conflict occurs. Slide. So I'm going to read this quote very quickly. <clears throat> These attributes, then, human nature took to itself from the side of the brutes. For those qualities with which brute life armed for self-preservation, when transferred to human life, became passions. Keyword here is passions. They, are, they mean like a pathology, a problem. For the carnivorous animals are preserved by their anger, and those which breed largely by their love for pleasure. Cowardice preserves the weak, fear that which is easily taken by more powerful animals, and greediness those of great bulk. And to miss anything that tends to pleasure is for the brutes a matter of pain. All these and the like affections entered man's composition by reason of the animal mode of generation. Slide. So, just to summarize and keep it simple, um, there are certain animal characteristics that we now inherit because we've fallen away from where we were, and these kinds of attributes cause us problems. You can, you can see uh, fear, love of pleasure, cowardice. We can see that this kind of, perhaps, is the starting point for where mental illness occurs. And now I'm not talking about very specific issues such as relationship problems or something of the sort. I'm talking about a worldview, just very basic, what is causing problems at all. So just some quotes there. C.S. Lewis tells us that humans are half animal, half spirit. And then St. Paul tells us that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So already we have a bit of conflict. And you might want to say that the flesh is where the brain resides and the spirit is where the mind resides. Now, I'm not arguing for any immateriality, just, again, the same distinction. And there's a conflict between the flesh and the spirit, therefore a conflict between the brain and the mind. To go back to the original perspective that we had, I don't think I mentioned it. Um, we are brought up in a way, our, our brains, um, to ensure that we survive. That is the way our brains have been found to program. And we have different priorities. Our minds want to think different things. For example, we want to succeed in life. We want relationships, and there's often a conflict between what 
we are um, primed to do and what we want to do. Okay, slide. So the Christian solution is simple. Um, Christ comes down, the perfect human, human being version 2, the second Adam as the Copts call him, and he shows us what a proper human being looks like, and he calls us to follow him and tells us that he will restore us to where we were at the beginning. Now, very important, this is not to replace psychology. We're not saying that if you become a Christian, you're, not, you're going to be free of mental illness. Not at all. We're simply saying that uh, Christ will, that, that Christianity aims to reverse the effects of the fall. Now, individual psychological issues need to be tended as individual psychological issues in a counseling office. And that's what we would say. Um, but it is the Christian worldview, with love centered in it, that we would say puts psychology in its proper context. Okay? That is all. Are there any questions? Yes? Yes. Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, the word, the Greek word for flesh is different for the Greek word for body. So flesh denotes something rotten and corrupt. So the body was what we had at the beginning. And it's become flesh, if you, if you like. Um, and because it's flesh, uh, it has passions. So it has desires which are like those of the animals. And there's a, you could go, yeah, sorry. You want a follow-up question? Um, you could, you know, go, go into the complexities of the mechanics of what happened before and after. But that's the basics. Yeah, yeah and just person. and was that does that mean that the because that desire to be like God that initiated the fall mm. did that desire be of the uh, of the body? Um, no, I wouldn't say that was specifically of the body. So where would it be if it wasn't if there was no flesh? Um, there was a body, but not flesh. Okay, so we would say there was a physical body, but it wasn't corrupt. Simply put. Um, the spirit can sin as well, if that helps. Okay, okay so in the, in the flesh there are certain, certain problems, like the love of pleasure and cowardice and greed and things like that, which take us to that. Um, but it's not that the body, it's not that physicality is evil in any way. Yes? Yeah. It just so happens that the flesh has taken on those properties because it's become related to animals. Does that kind of answer? Kind of, yeah. And, if, and in that reverse state of being, returning back and that person of Christ he, he added to that. Mm -hmm. Does that, um, like, is it, is it possible that that fall could happen again? Um, is it possible that a fall could happen again? I'm taking time up, but I'll answer your questions. Um, a fall could happen again after we've been restored, you would say? If, yeah, if that's the case. Yeah. Well, the aim is that only those who make it to heaven will be the ones who truly want it, and they will have worked for it throughout their lives with pain and suffering. So it's kind of you've taken your whole life to get somewhere. Are you going to go and turn back after really struggling to get there? I see what you're saying. That, I don't think so. Which follows to the last one. Yes. <laughs> Sorry to take up your time. No, that's fine. With the, um, if it's, if uh, humanity was ultimately perfect initially and then there was mm. the fall, yep. then that goes back to the theology of why the fall in the first place, if it was perfect. Why the fall in the first place? It was perfect in so much that it was without stain or any corruption, but it was made in, in a state where it could be corrupt to necessitate the existence of a free will, which denotes the ability to produce great good or great evil in return. Yes? Okay. Yeah. okay. Any other questions? Microphone, please. Sorry. Yes, yes. Can we pass the other mic, please? Okay, so before the fall, there were no passions, no drives whatsoever? Um, there were, okay, so the, the fathers, there are different perspectives, but the one I'm going to give you, and I think the right one, is that um, passions are corrupted, perhaps you would say emotional states. So, for example, lust is a corrupted version of the pure love that we have. So there were drives, but there were drives which were pure, and there were drives which were uh, not against God, so to speak. Okay? When the fall occurred, they became out of control, and they became overwhelming to the point where they began to control men um, and lead to things like 
addictions and things like that. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Do you have a follow-up question or shall we move on? The free will concept, yes, okay. Um, this stems back to, a, I don't know, you could call it an assumption by Christianity that the essence of all reality is love. And I think to have any world, you have to make assumptions. So let's, I think I can let myself go with that one. Um, that necessitates, when you have love, you have to have multiple, you have to have more than one party in order for love to be shared. Yep. In order for there to be love to be shared, um, you must have a choice to give that love. Now, the only thing that has choice is God. Therefore, God has to create something which is like Him, thus in His image, uh, in order to be able to love and to be loved back. Okay, so He creates man um, to be perfect in so much that man is near God. Because man is the creator thing, he is finite. Um, but in so long as that he is near God, he, is, uh, he bathes in ultimate love, in eternal life, um, love and things of the sort. So because his creator is finite, but because he stays with his creator, he can share in the infiniteness of the creator. Yes? Yeah, that's all fine so far. So he has to have free will. Now, if he chooses to leave the creator, he will lose his infiniteness and begin to go back to it. He will begin to decompose. And that also results in a kind of moral breakdown as well. And that's where the passions come. Um, I would like to give our other speaker a go. If there are questions, we'll have plenty of time to go through them. Um, because there is a whole hour for discussion. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Graham Barker, is a clinical psychologist, an educator, a pastor, an author, a parent, a grandfather, and a fisherman. Um, he spent a good many years in staff missionaries, been the pastor of a Baptist church, chairman of a Christian school board. He has a doctorate, of course, in clinical psychology. Um, he worked in a private psychology practice here in New South Wales, Montevale. He's wrote co authored books on marriage, stress management, and a manual of Christian counselors. He started programs at the Wesley Institute in America, which does Christian counseling. Um, among many other achievements, he served in Uganda, uh, helping with trauma responses, and now he has retired um, for some leisurely activities, including still mission work um, and writing and other things of the sort. I'd like to walk now to Ray. Thank you, Paul. Good evening. How are you? Okay. Buckle up. You know, fast ride here. The first thing I want to do uh, is take you on a little biblical journey. You're familiar with the story of Elijah, Mount Carmel? Okay, real quick, um, before we change the slide there, Father. Um, Elijah was a prophet of Israel. Ahab and Jezebel were the king and the queen, but they were following the gods of Baal. And so there's always this conflict between the king and the queen and the, the prophets of God. Well, Elijah challenged these prophets, kind of a showdown. And they went up to Mount Carmel and they had their turn to have their gods demonstrate their power. And so the gods of Baal got their sacrifice and they put it on the altar and the idea was they were going to pray and have their god come and burn the altar, burn the, the, um, the sacrifice. Well, the gods of Baal went at it all day and Elijah was a bit of a character and he kept saying, well, maybe he's asleep. You know, a little louder, guys, a little louder. 
and he goaded them. And then their time was up. So Elijah had his sacrifice put on the altar. And then he said, I want you to dig a moat around the altar, altar, fill it with water, and then soak and soak and soak the sacrifice. And then he stood back and asked God to demonstrate his power and justify what had just happened. And down came the lightning, down came the thunder, and bang, everything was consumed. Well, Elijah then took a, this to mean that he was um, given the right to go into battle for the Lord and he slaughtered 300 of the Baal priests and as many as, as their prophets. This did not go down well at the palace. And so Ahab and Jezebel, um, who Elijah had expected to cave in when the demonstration occurred of God's power and the impotence of the gods of Baal, or Baal and his prophets. So follow me on this one. Elijah is now really punked. And he's expecting to wake up the next day and hear that Jezebel and Ahab had disappeared. They'd left. But he woke up to this message from Jezebel and Ahab. Tomorrow you're dead meat. I'm going to do to you what you've done to my prophets. You are going to be dead meat. Elijah drops his bundle. His expectations were up here. The reality is down here. And he's got a problem. And in the book of First Kings, chapter 19, you get the story. You want to just kick on that next one? Elijah runs for his life. He just tears off into the desert. He ran to evade capture. And what we're seeing here is a prophet of the Lord spiralling into suicidal depression. He isolated. He went with his servant and then he left his servants and went by himself further into the desert. And he lay down under a bush and lost all hope and begged to die. Now you may be familiar with some of these symptoms, but these fit the symptoms of a depressed person and Elijah was really depressed to the point of suicide. And suicide is a high risk situation, as you know. There's very few people that survive it to tell us about it. But it's also one of the most common ways young people and the very elderly end their life. Because they lose hope, they're isolated, and all they can think about is to escape the pain and the anguish, and then they get suicidal thoughts. How does God deal with this? It's one of his prophets. Well, I'm going to show you how God dealt with it. Well, thank you very much there. Because it shows that psychology really is the classification and application of biblical principles. There are many biblical principles that can be taken out of scripture, but what's happened is the psychologists, through their own independent studies, 
are coming to the same conclusions, but they're classifying. They're lumping them together. They're seeing how they relate, the things that the biblical writers didn't do. But here we've got Elijah under a bush wanting to die. So let's have a look and see what happens. First of all, he meets his physical needs. Chapter 19, 5 through 9. He's put to sleep. He needs the rest. He's exhausted from his depression. Remember, he was on the mountain on a high, expectations, and then hits the valley floor and he's flawed. He's bought food by the birds and he's got water. See the physical is very important. There's a reference about sarks and the body a minute ago. There's, there was a Greek idea that grew up and was still around in the time of Christ called Gnosticism, particularly that produced by this heretic named Serinthius that said only the mind and the spirit were good, the body was disastrous. And two th groups came out of that. There were those that were the Stoics that deprived their body because they say it was worthless and focused on the mind. But then there were what we would call the hedonists who said, since the body has no value, it doesn't matter, you can do anything you want with it. But God says, no, the body is important. It's part of my creation. So taking care of Elijah's physical needs is very important. And if you're depressed, you'll need somewhere, somehow, somebody to look after your physical needs. And then he sent him on a long, long walk, physical exercise. I mean, I'm stretching a point here, but the point is you've got to get moving. If he'd have stayed under that bush, things would not have improved. When you move, the brain produces endorphins that create a sense of, hey, I'm doing okay. Then he removed the feared objects by taking him a long way away from what we would call, you know, the negative stimuli. That is Ahab, Jezebel and their army. And then he puts him in a cave, in a mountain, where he feels tight and secure and safe. His physical needs were important. And we're finding, because there's so much connected to the brain, which is part of our physical complex, we need to take care of our physical being. And psychology has health psychology, which is about taking care of those sorts of things. It's one of about 27 different fields in psychology. Then he met his cognitive needs. He engages Elijah in dialogue. Hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? What's been happening? Why are you so down? Tell me your story. And Elijah makes these amazing statements. His perceptions were distorted. He said, God, I've done nothing but serve you. And look what you've done for me. I'm the only one that's ever stood up for you. I'm alone in this. Where are you? He was as angry as a hornet. But he had a belief system that said he was alone, he was doing God's work, where was God? He was betrayed. So God has to correct his erroneous thinking. And towards the end of the chapter he says, Elijah, get real. You're one of 7,000 of my prophets. 
you're not, you know, you're not alone in this. I've got 7,000 in reserve. So you don't play well, all the benches are going to come on. He had this idea that he was the one and only. God corrects that. But he needed to know why Elijah was so depressed. He wanted to know the belief behind the action. And Elijah's belief was because he was doing something for God, God ought to do something for him. I did this on the mountain. How come Ahab and Jezebel are still around? His cognitions were self-focused, not God-focused. So then he met his emotional needs. And this is a wonderful part. He's in this cave. And he basically says to God, you did that on the mountain, what's happened? You know, where are you now? So God says, okay, just kind of hold your breath and hang on. And the scriptures tell us that the mountain shook, there was fire, there was wind, there was all sorts of natural phenomena occurring. And God was saying to Elijah, I can do this any time you want, any time I want. The big show is not the only thing I can do, but I can do it any time. And the mountain was shaking. And he says, God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the shaking or the fire. God was in the still, small voice that came to Elijah. And that was the assurance. God was still in control. That brought safety, that sense of peace, that well-being back into Elijah's life. And then he got him moving. And this is an interesting thing. He said, Elijah, I want you to go back the way you came. So he had to go back and face those things that had caused his problem. And he gave him graduated tasks. He had to go and anoint some minor kings. And then he gave him the biggest job of all. Some of you may be in business or in, a, in an office somewhere. How would you feel if someone came along and said, oh look, here's so and so, I want you to train them up because they're going to take over your job. You go, hmm, I wonder how I can mess this up. But that's what he said. He said, I want you to mentor my junior prophet, Elisha, to become my next great prophet. That was an amazing honour, far more important than getting rid of Ahab and Jezebel. He was to mentor God's next, probably the great prophet, Elisha. But that gave him a sense of purpose again a sense of well-being. So you can see what's happened here. From scripture we can see how God met physical needs, emotional needs, cognitive needs. Psychology is just about that. And Christian psychologists see their role is to move with God's Spirit to get a person to take another step towards being Christ-like, bringing their emotions, their behaviour and their cognitions in line with the Father. Just using Elijah, you can see that many of today's cognitive, emotionally focused and behavioural therapies can be found in the Scriptures. The Scriptures are a trustworthy document even for psychologists. What are my basic beliefs that I think are important as a psychologist and a Christian? Well, truth resides in the creator of truth. 
which means that all truth is God's truth. Doesn't matter where you find it, if it's true, it has to have come from the creator of truth. And God has revealed himself through special revelation. We talk about special revelation as his word, right? That's special. That is revelation that has been given in word form or has communicated in those propositional truths. But that's not the only way. Hebrews tells us that God has spoken to us in many ways, called general revelation. He speaks to us and he has given us truth in the medical field. Not only the medical field. I just mentioned a couple. Botany. The heavens. Scripture says that the heavens declare his handiwork and through the science of psychology. Wherever there is truth, it is because God has put it there. Which means that as a Christian, you can utilise any part of God's creation that has been shown to be true. Now I'm just going to depart from my little script here. Because we have propositional truth, it's easy to access. It's quite easy to open God's word and get at the truth. Now it's not easy all the time because interpretation comes in. We'll talk about that. But the further you move away from God's word, the harder it is to access truth. It's not saying it's not there, it's just more difficult. You can't open up you know, a piece of coal and go, oh, I can see God's truth here. But there's God's truth in the minerals. But they're not as easy to access. It just means you've got to dig a little harder. Psychology is one discipline through which our Creator has revealed truth. Developing or discovering and interpreting that truth depends on our perceptions. All right, so I'm going to get a little bit of psychology here about perception. What you see may be common. You may all see something, like you may all see me, unless you've got some sort of visual impairment. But what you actually compute as to who I am, that's different. The data may be the same, but you may see it and interpret it differently. Because our perceptions are largely derived from our belief system and our experiences. Just think about that. Our perceptions derived from our belief system and our experiences. When I was in Uganda, I would have young boys come up to me and they would ask me for money. Now, their perception is if you're a Mzungu or a white man, you have lots of money. That's their perception. Wrong, but at any rate, that's their perception. Because their belief is the white man controls all the money and therefore I'm a white person, the logic is, therefore I've got money that I will give them. And often I gave them what I had, but it was a misperception because their belief and they watch the television and they see you know the American uh, television programs if you're white you drive a big car big house, swimming pool and all the rest of it 
just like you do in Mount Druid, right? But they they don't in Kampala or Kasisi or Gulu. Perceptions are largely derived from our belief system and our experience. That little, what would you call that, an oval, I want you to imagine as a lens in your mind. A lens through which stimuli arrives. That can be anything through any of your senses. It's taken by the nervous system you have through to the mind. And out of it comes the perceptions. The only problem is if you hold a lens to the light or anything, what happens to the incoming light? Anybody? It, it, it gets bent out of shape, it gets deflected. And so what comes out may look nothing like what went in. There was a famous episode, and for these people that are under the age of 50, just kind of learn something here. Um, there was a, a lady in the eastern suburbs who the ambulances were going by her house. She had been a survivor of a Second World War concentration camp. And back then in the Sydney ambulance system, the sirens that the ambulances used were the same as the Nazi or the Gestapo Claxton horns. And so she would have a traumatic response every time an ambulance went by. Why? Because her perception had been shaped by trauma in her past. So now she heard a Claxton, she went into collapse. But see, other things shape our perceptions, our childhood, our education, our faith. There's two empty spaces there, I and mean, there could be a dozen empty spaces, but what else could go in there? What is it that could shape the lens of our mind that alters our perception of what is coming in, what the data is saying. I'm willing to take any bids here. Any experience, negative or positive. If you've had a great experience and you come across something that's similar, you've got confidence. But if it's been a negative experience like that lady, it could be a bad perception. So positive, negative experiences. Yep. Ah, yes. Well, it depends on your belief system about the experience. If you had been living in the eastern suburbs and all your experience had been was Claxton's on ambulances, you would not have a bad reaction. But her experience was very bad with that Claxton sound. So your experience is going to feed your belief system and your belief system is going to reinforce or establish your experience. It becomes a bit of a cycle. But if you, if you have had bad experiences, trauma, maybe you've had a really good childhood and you, like Elijah, figured everything was going to be fine in your life and something went bad. Another example of that is a young child who everything is really fine and then mum and dad divorce or split up. Everything was fine and now one of their parents is gone. 
How does the child usually respond? Well, let me tell you. You have a space where you have no answers to the questions. The fallen human mind usually, in 99% of the cases, fill it with a negative. Young children assume that they've done something wrong that causes the problem with their parents. Because everything was fine. And then they start to think, what did I do to make this happen? Because you see, adults are always right. Must be my fault. So that experience can create some very, very bad consequences. The negative will always fill the void. You get that picture. Your mind, your perceptions are shaped by the experiences. The one that thing didn't come up there was genetics. You know, there is a part that genetics play in that. But your lens is ground by your experiences and your belief system. Or your belief system is ground by your experiences. Ultimately, though, it's going to affect the way you see things. Elijah had the experience on the mountain and the expectation suddenly soared. When they weren't met, down he came. This is how it works. Your basic presuppositions, the things that you believe about yourself, about God, about what mental health is, about what it means for you to be a Coptic Christian, whatever. They will influence your worldview, as will your interpretation. Physical data, everybody sees it. But how you interpret it, that's where you put in the lens, is going to affect your worldview. That and your presuppositions come together on how you view your world. That then feeds back into your interpretation of data. Your worldview affects the way you see and interpret the data. How many of you have read the Quran? Someone's dabbled? Okay. If you read it, would you read it with an open mind? Probably not. See, how many of the Islamic faith read the scriptures with an open mind? No, because their worldview is different. You know, I'm, now you'll have, I'm going to back away here. I'm a mad St. George supporter. Anybody else here game to put their hand up? All oh, right, my brother. We went to the same high school, by the way. So. so no matter who's playing, when there's a penalty awarded to the other team, who's really in the wrong? The other team. Because St George players don't do bad things. They're totally clean, totally committed to the game and the rules. Okay? But I've got a flawed perception because I'm a fallen person and I know somewhere in the back of my mind that we're just as dirty as Penrith or Parramatta. Okay? But our world view as Christians is going to affect the way we see things. So if you're a non-Christian psychologist, your view of life and your view of what sin and mental illness has to say is going to be a big factor. By the way, if you've got any questions, put your hand up. You know, I hope I'm not kind of running too fast here. You know, yes, good. 
You want to just pass that across? Yeah. Because you uphold the Christian worldview, when you come to work with someone who doesn't believe or someone who doesn't um, have who doesn't have a belief in a higher being in general, um, how do you work with that? And where do your principles um, come to your assistance or come to your aid when the other person doesn't even believe that there's a higher being or doesn't believe in religion in general? Can I ask a clarification point here? When you say work with, you mean as a colleague or a patient? Uh, as a patient. Okay. I'll get to that. Can I just put it on hold? Because basically, it's how I'm going to view them. But I will have to acknowledge or make an announcement of some disclosure to them about what my view is. All right? But we'll get to that. That's a good point. Here's another on my perceptions. That there's no real contradiction between sound psychological research and biblical principles. Good psychology is good theology. Now that's a presupposition. Eh? That's my belief system at work. But I do that from having studied both theology and psychology. And the little example from Elijah can show how they do actually say the same thing in a different language. Proverbs 23.7 As man thinks in his heart, so he is. In other words, your thoughts and your belief system will determine your behaviour. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Well, it's only been 60 years in the life of cognitive psychology that people like Jean Piaget and so on came up with the idea that your cognitions precede behaviour. The author of Proverbs knew that a long time ago. As iron sharpens iron, so man sharpens man. That was kind of the, the theme for our counselling department at Wesley. I was just saying before we spoke, before, that the, the neuroscientists now are saying the most significant thing about change, what facilitates change is relationships. No real change occurs in a person's life without relationship through mirror neurons in the effects of neurology and neuroscience. But it's back in Proverbs. Just like iron sharpens iron, man sharpens man. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. One of the most significant discoveries of psychology in the last 20 years has been that forgiveness is a powerful tool in healing. Until you can let go the hurt that someone has done you, you are emotionally tied to that person. It's until you forgive them. Remember forgiveness is more to your benefit. If you forgive someone who's wronged you, you are no longer emotionally tied to them. Well, hang on. Jesus said that, and Paul emphasised that back in biblical times. How about this one? Anger is best dealt with righteously and involves a focus, forgiveness, and opportunity for healing. There's been a lot of research from Duke University, from Pepperdine University, big studies on forgiveness and anger. And anger is best dealt with as soon as you can with the object of your anger that there is an expression of your hostility towards them rather than belt them up, you talk about it. 
and it's an opportunity for healing. But Paul said that back in Ephesians. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Dialogue on it. Deal with it. Don't let it build up lest the, the Satan get a foothold. Even the Old Testament said about the roots of bitterness, that's depression that can come from anger. And we know that a lot of anger that's internalised leads to depression. But hang on, we've known it for thousands of years. But you see, it's never been classified and connected like modern research has been able to do. Another perception, and this is where the, it will answer that question. A psychologist with a Christian worldview has a better view of reality than one without. That's a big statement. I once spoke at Sydney Uni, the psych program there, on Christianity as a reality system. We kind of went off on a lot of tangents. But the truth is that Christians with a Christian or a psychologist with a Christian worldview has a more complete view of man. Behaviorists for a long time said that man's mind was like a black box. There's nothing in there that you need to work on. Now it's become cognitive behavioral they realize that man has a mind and he has actions that follow. But what does a Christian have in terms of his view of man? Man is not only body and soul, he is spirit. Psychology it's made up of two words, psyche, meaning soul, and logos, meaning what? Word, or to know, right? But the spirit doesn't come in. But a Christian can see when a person's got depression in their spirit, when their spirit is alive, or whether it's dormant or dead, as well as understanding the mind, emotion and will which makes up a soul. So a Christian has a more complete view of man. So when someone comes they can deal with the whole person, not a fragment of it. I struggle with cognitive behavioural therapy for everything because sometimes it's not that. Sometimes there's an emotional issue that has a spiritual basis. There may be guilt, there may be shame, there may be sin that's never dealt with unless you've got a big picture of man. It's also a complete view of functionality. You could put in there what is healthy. We've got the model of Jesus. Paul says as a Christian our goal is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And we can look at Jesus and find that in all the areas of humanity he was complete. We know what it's like. We know that Christ was a servant leader and that goes against the Macquarie model, you know, where you lead by strength and domination we have a different picture of what it means to function as a human. One of my favourite movies, you let us say that in here, is, is Blade Runner. Anybody? All right. Blade Runner's basic theme is what's humanity? How can you tell who's the robot and who's human? What, does it make a, what is it that makes a person human? Well, I think as a Christian I can say that with far more confidence because I've seen and engaged with the ultimate human in Christ. 
Nobody challenging that? Okay, I'll move on. But that means we also have a better view of dysfunction. When I was in graduate school, Carl Menninger, a very, very well-known and the head of the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, but one of the all-time biggies, right? He wrote a book entitled, Whatever Became of Sin? This is a secular psychiatrist. In reading the book, however, sin is when you cross and transgress the boundaries of another person. There was no kind of vertical dimension here with God in it, but just the idea that psychiatry has left out human responsibility. You're responsible for what you do. You can't keep tracing it back and find out it really is your great-grandfather's dog that caused it. There's human responsibility. We have to accept that there are many things that may cause a person to respond, like you take the anger. There may be a lot of things that make you angry. You're not responsible for the feeling, but you're responsible for how you respond to it. It can't be explained away and given a nice smoothing over and a coat of white paint and saying, it's all right. But that's what psychiatry and psychology were trying to do remove human responsibility because it's society's problem. Kid goes off the rails, it's because we haven't given him enough education or his parents hadn't given him the right instruction. That may be true. Think of Joseph. You know, sibling rivalry. Dad likes Joseph, gives him this special coat the brothers all go, we'll get him, you know, beat him up, put him down a well. Bunch of travelling um, Arabs heading off to Egypt on a camel train. They tie Joseph to the last camel, right? So he's travelling behind the rear end of a camel for a couple of hundred K, sold into slavery, put into prison accused of rape, rotting away. God then turns him into the number two man in, the, in Pharaoh's parliament or kingdom and becomes the saviour of his people. So yeah, people do have a bad experience in their life. Joseph had a bunch of them and it says he never doubted God. There's a bigger picture here. And dysfunction has to be considered as a person who is not taking responsibility as one of the factors in that. Their behaviour has to be accounted for. Okay. Am I boring you here? Do you want me to no, keep going? Or, okay. Since Christian spirits are redeemed, we know that a Christian has their spirit redeemed. Right? That's, the, that's what happens. However, our souls, our mind, emotions and our will are in process. You know, we're still in conflict. We're not going to be perfect till we hit those heavenly gates. We're still prone to sinful frailties and failures. Right? As many Christians are in treatment as non-Christians. Think about that. As many Christians get depressed, get anxious, have bipolar, have schizophrenia, as non-Christians in, you know, comparison. But recovery appears to be faster and more complete for those people in faith, including Christians. In other words, we're not immune because we're Christians, but because we have God's spirit, we have hope, because we have God's community, we have support, we recover faster. That's what the statistics will tell us. That doesn't mean that we're immune. So don't think that because you're a Christian, 
things are going to be perfect. Remember, it's only your spirit that's been redeemed. Your body is in process of redemption. Go. You put your hand up, you got the answer? Oh. Go to the website for Duke University and its Department of Christianity and Mental Health. They've got zillions of studies. It's a good, by the way, it's a great website, right? They've got a whole department looking at, at that subject. Well, pe yeah, people who of faith who have who have hope, right? Yeah. But I'm saying that Christians, because they have God's Spirit, that hope is focused. It's just not hope in a in a bigger belief, but hope in something objective and something specific. But the but the the studies are broader. But Christians are included in that. Can I? Sorry. <laughs> And I just, um, it's not really a question, but because um, I'm, I'm studying a, a relevant branch of psychology, so it's counselling, it's not really psychiatry or um, psychology, so I don't know how relevant my, um, my thoughts or my impressions are going to be, so can I ask now? Always relevant. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, so it's, as, it's just, it seems that um, you have, when you were talking about the Christian um, psychologists or psych shrink <laughs> a person that um, does all the work with who whoever upholds the Christian values it seems like it seems that you have very general um, you think of patients in very general terms and I keep contrasting what you were saying in the previous slide to some of the models the counseling models that I have been studying like the person-centered or the client-centered um, model of counseling, for example, where the client is the expert, or we deem the client the expert rather than us having a holistic vision of what's functional or what is dysfunctional, because what's functional for you may not be functional for me, and vice versa. Isn't that, yeah, that's, that's part of the problem with the humanistic model. See, we've got propositional truth that says if you're an adulterer it's wrong when I went to, to grad school one of the new therapies was hot tub therapy where groups would all get their gear off and hop into the same tub together because now we're open and free and we and get therefore there'd be nothing in the way of reality well you can't do that as a Christian and remember, person-centered therapy is, is great, but it's based on the assumption that each person has within them the capacity to solve their own problems. Yeah, it's called self-actualization. That's right. But the problem is, Scripture tells us in Jeremiah that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. We will deceive ourselves at, at any cost. So to be able to say that we don't need any external observation of our behaviour or external study of our thoughts, and but we have the we have the capacity ourselves is believing that we have individual truth, and there's no absolute truth. So the principles are fine: unconditional, positive regard, empathy self-worth, all those things are important. But underneath it, there's the assumption that man is on, in control of his own life and he's on the throne. Well, it, well, in that way, since you put it in that way, don't you think that having Christian principles and bringing our Christian upbringing or Christian uh, principles, they count as some kind of, um, of judgments or preconceived judgments. And once you bring that to the therapy process, um, then you... Well, you're not allowing, because isn't, isn't the ultimate goal of therapy or psychology or counselling in general, isn't it the personal healing of the clients rather than um, tr trying to get them to match up to the standards that we hold as Christians? That's a good point. You must ask yourself, what does healing 
entail? Does that mean that you can have a person go out and their symptoms have been reduced? Just let's call it improving their quality of life. Yeah, well, I would say no. The goal of therapy, right? I mean, where I sit, the goal of therapy is the completion of developmental tasks, things that are holding people back from self-actualizing. But ultimately, we are to present all people mature in Christ. That's the goal for a Christian, is to present everyone. So in my therapy, I don't, I don't bring my presuppositions in, but I let them know that I see them as a whole person, and I might say to them, look, we've just finished 15 sessions of therapy, but you know there's some issues that we never got to. At some point, they're going to come back and bite you, and I'd like you to just remember to give me a call when that happens. And they'll go, what sort of issues? And I'll go, well, the issues that say that we actually have all the answers, that we actually are in control of our lives, and that we don't need anybody else to do it. They're usually narcissists who, to whom I speak, but because um, I specialize in personality disorders. But I don't come in with a, here's a list of do's and don'ts. You've got to work with the data. You've got to work with the person. And you, I use, you know, Rogerian empathy, and I use all that. But in my mind, I'm trying to get them to accept responsibility, take some steps towards healing, mind, emotion, and spirit. So if, if, if I am to do or to apply the same, um, the same thing, having the same goal in my mind, mm. then wouldn't that be a mixture of models or a theories rather than just being a Christian counselor who, has, who happens to um, have a certain set of beliefs um, how does that distinguish you or me okay. from... Every model, every model, right? And there's 265 last count that the APA has said are evidence-based, right? Every model has got aspects to it that are valuable. And as long, this is, my, this is the way I distinguish. A model has, can be used unless it overtly contradicts scripture, but like hot tub therapy, right? That's good, don't even bring it up. Okay, but that, that, was, a, that, was, a, that was a form of gestalt, right? If it doesn't contradict scripture, then I go, how consistent is it with my understanding of Christian principles of the dignity of persons, the diversity of persons, the fallenness of persons, and the need of persons. So if it's consistent with those, it's not contradictory to what God says in any way, then it's worth investigating. You know, Freud gets a lot of bad press, right? But let me tell you, they're finding research now that says probably he wasn't off the base as much as everybody said. That people do have intrinsic self-interest. Survival, procreation, whatever. That's the, the erotic or the, um, the life force aspect. So even Freudian stuff, there's value in there. I mean, you've got to understand where you came from, you know, middle class, Viennese, Jewish population. He only ever concentrated on 20 clients in his lifetime. You know, so there's a lot of things you don't. But there's some, there's truth. Remember, wherever you find it, if it's shown to be true, you can use it because it's God's anointing of healing. So I, I use that. Basically, though, I think dynamically. But, you know, but a lot of people come in and they don't want to spend two years working on their personality. They want to come in and get over their anxiety. You know, so you use the techniques that are necessary, but all the time remembering what Paul says in Philippians 4 about how to get over anxiety and what's at the base of anxiety. 
actually. So, but you don't you don't come in with your T-shirt that says "Repent," you know, because that's that's what I call a reductionist model that says that everything can be cured with a Bible verse, Jesus only. Well, yeah, but. Jesus used all sorts of things. Every time he encountered somebody, he changed his model to meet their need. Right? And so, being a reductionist, whether that means that you're a spiritual reductionist, you know, all mental illness is sin, or whether you're a, a materialistic naturalist reductionist that says, you know, faith is a lot of hogwash, you just got to go with the scientific method. Well, Remember that to get to a scientific method, you have to have an experimental process with a hypothesis that you have to test and retest and retest, and then you come at it and you have to have it peer supported, otherwise, your own biases come through. But the same thing in theology you've got a, a, a process, there's about five stages between when, when it was actually given, the authors you know, the actual autographs before we actually get to the point where we can say this is what it says. It's hermeneutics. But then your own biases come in. So you've got to be very careful about pronouncing what is truth. But when it's consistent, you're fairly confident. Okay, can I move on and we can, we can talk, we're going to have question time. Or are we going into that already? Pardon? Oh, there's a break? Oh, good. Okay. That's good. I was wondering about that. Um, oh, you're going to dismiss them. They come back? Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Graham. That was brilliant. Um, we're going to have a break now. You have 15 minutes. What is the time? Let me see. It's 7.50. Can we be back roughly five past eight? I believe there are snacks outside. Is that true? Yep. Feel free. Thank you. Be back soon. Well, I hope it sparks some discussion. I'd hate to just think I was mouthing off. No, I think you will. Wait your break before everybody else attacks. I need to ask you about um, your therapist and your diagnosis. How does being a Christian psychologist if you're presenting a case, and for example, homosexuality is leading to the assembly, and and what Paul was talking about right at the beginning, what they knew, and then how it developed hysteria, and was no longer group traveling, and they had it wrong. Whatever the issues are, how do you your biases or your presuppositions affect your diagnosis? Do they? Um, or do you not let them? First and foremost, you're a psychologist, you're not preaching. What? No, no, no. So, do you take that into the, the therapy? So, your the, the diagnosis can be based on the number. The DSM is a psychiatric medical model that's yes, based on symptoms. I present the symptoms, and you don't treat me as a Christian. But I'm saying the DSM is, is a symptom based diagnosis. Yes, yeah. You've got four out of these six. It's your diagnosis. But it's a bigger picture. A family therapist would say, okay, this is your, this, you'll tick that box. Well, let's go back and have a look at your genogram. Let's go back and see what else is involved. See? So it's a bigger picture. And if people like, if they're, let's say for example, they're high anxiety, and it's not performance anxiety or separation anxiety, it's annihilation. Alright? And you, you dig and you dig and you find out they're afraid that God's going to destroy them. So you've got, you know, here you've got an opportunity to say, okay, because, you know, you're a, you're a spiritual being, and that's going to affect your perception. So it's just not. Diagnosing by symptoms, it's diagnosing by context. 
as well as the history of that person. And my Christian view will say this person is just not a load of symptoms. They're a whole person. Mind, body, uh, soul, three aspects need healing. They all need to be healed. And I'm, my voice needs to be healed. I need to do something. Yeah, let's, it's sad. Uh, okay, and I'll be back. I just have a quick question. Um, yeah, but there's no quick answers. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, many of the Christians here don't entertain a visualistic biblical interpretation like uh, the story of Genesis and the fall of Adam, the life of the Holy Man. Um, so, uh, the question is how do people not believe that they have some kind of something to run in the past to kind of Yeah, I don't know, but like you're talking about Adam and Eve, but in the garden. I 
No worries, and you can refill from there whenever you need to. Yeah. No, that was very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you'll have some interesting questions.
Okay, everyone, if you'd like to come back in and take your seat, it's the grilling session. Settle down, we're about to start. Can everyone file in please and take your seats? Can we get some quiet please? We're about to start. Because I've never seen a psychological point of view or yeah. a psychology study point of view on some of those questions. Yeah. That's why I asked them. Did you find but a different perspective or the same? Oh, not so much, but I just, uh, it's not a direct answer for me. It's more a puzzle. Like, I've got to put it together. But... Yeah. Got to be tough with these guys. Okay, everyone, we're going to start. Um, if everyone would like to take their seat, we have a limited time because we will be finishing 9 o'clock on the dot as advertised. So if we could please make a start, because I, I, I'm sure there are already lots of really interesting questions that people would like to ask. So we'd like to give them uh, enough of a time. Now, can I just remind everyone, uh, questions are open. You may ask anything you like. We would ask you to please, though, try to keep your questions as brief as you can, just to give lots of other people a chance to ask their questions. Um, and uh, Paul will be moderating uh, together with Dr. Barker. Uh, let's try and not spend too long on any one particular topic, unless it's incredibly, incredibly interesting. Uh, but apart from that, let's sort of try and cover quite a few topics. So uh, I'll hand over once again. By the way, not, there are some questions that are off limits. I will not give you my PIN number, nor my wife's weight, okay? Yes, sir. The man in blue. Get the mic, please. You mentioned Freud before. Um, so I'm just wondering, obviously Freud talked about the, e the ego and the superego, that, three, that, three part, that man's got three parts. And obviously Christianity talks about the, mind, uh, you know, the body, the soul, and the spirit. So to me, it did seem there was actually some sort of correlation. But I'm interested in your views on that. Well, Freud would disagree because he was an atheist. Mm. Um, there are many people who see that correlation like the superego as conscience. The id would be the governing mind in its healthy state and the id would be those unhealthy drives, right? And so we talk about the sinful part. But that's not what Freud meant. And I think if you get into that simplistic way of looking at it, you miss benefits of the fine-tuning that Freud was trying to do. So I don't see there's a direct compatibility there. Um, someone like Jung, who was a spiritualist, um, disagreed with Freud on all of those points. Um, so um, yeah, I think you get in trouble if you try and reduce things down to fit. It's a nice 
paradigm to work on, transactional analysis did the same thing, you know. The, the parent was the adult, was the superego, the adult was the ego, and the child was the, the id, you know. And that was a helpful thing for people to use. But you can't just match them perfectly. They don't. They're just two different, it's like two languages. You might find some commonalities, but they won't translate across the board. Yeah. So any other questions? Can we get a mic front? down the front? Sorry, can you just wait for the mic, please, because it's recorded. When you have a new patient, how do you bring up or establish what their belief system is? I mean, if you're going to actually address people differently if they're a Christian or not a Christian. Well, that was asked by one of my uh, interlopers who took over my time. Um, basically, if I know they're a person of faith, whatever, <coughs> I'll ask them how that informs their their view of themselves, their, their view of what the healing process will be, and you, that way it kind of moves them out. Plus, I'll ask them questions like, tell me what you were thinking when you did that. Where did that thought come from? What's your basis of behaviour on that issue? You know, I mean, it's just a, it's, it's an interviewing process whereby you start from where you are in the known and you move into the unknown. But simple question like, you know, how does your faith um, inform what's happening? Or tell me a little bit about yourself, what you believe, where you've come from, your church, your whatever. Yeah. Yep, we get a mic there. <clears throat> I don't think they could hear you up the back. I had a, sorry, a question about what Paul was saying at the beginning as well, and maybe all, all three of you could answer this. Maybe Paul needs to come and talk. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, and if I did, I don't necessarily agree with it. You said um, the state that we fell to from the fallen nature was just above an animalistic state, and whatever we remained there, and, and that's why our desires and so forth were corrupted, but in an orthodox Christian concept, in a Christian concept, doesn't baptism restore that? Doesn't that restore us back to the original state? I could be totally wrong. And there's a second question as well I have to answer. I'll have a go at that one. <coughs> or, or baptism and, and daily repentance okay. as well. Yeah. So that whole cleansing process. I'll let Graham answer that one. My belief is that what scripture says is that man is a little lower than the angels, not a little higher than the animals, right? Um, but um, I'm sure that Father Antonio will kind of correct me on this, but there is, there is a, a group within, like a division within Christianity of which the Orthodox would be part, that says that baptism removes the original sin. Is that fine? Slightly, yeah, okay. Um, but it, remember what I said, that a, when a person is redeemed, their spirit is redeemed. The, the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence and their eternal spirit is given life. But the psyche, the soul, mind, emotions and will have to be sanctified. They've got, that's a process they've got to go through. So I don't think that we're animalistic because we have the image of God within us, but we do have common factors with the, with the animal kingdom. I mean, we do have lungs that we have to breathe. You know, we do have genitalia with which we reproduce. We do have vision and so on. I mean, physically there's a bunch of things that says we are compatible. You know, I think God had one design, why mess with it, you know? He just basically did it everywhere. But the morality that humans have, the ability to think ahead and plan differently, all those things distinguish us from, from the animal kingdom. So 
Um, I think we're a little lower than the angels, more than a little higher than the animals. Father, or you want to say something there? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that um, as According to my understanding of the orthodox theology, we don't think of original sin in the same way that the Catholic Church might think of original sin. We, we think more of a corrupted world. The world as a whole has been corrupted and we continue to live. Even after you're baptized, you continue to live and be a part of that corrupted world. So baptism doesn't fix everything. Um, it's the beginning. It's a first step towards being restored to a perfect image of God. But that has to then be worked upon all your life. You have to continue to develop, you have to continue to change and repent and so on until you become that kind of creature of love who is a perfect image of God. I'm not there yet. Uh, none of us are. And there was just another question, so I wanted to ask with the whole creation, because uh, God loved us, he created us because he needed some creation to love. Again, I don't. Again, I could be wrong. I don't agree with that because, as Christians, we accept that God is love, and if God is eternal, then He was already loving and love before He created us. So, whether that be in the Trinity, whether that be in eternity, before there was a day speck of creation, so His His love didn't need to create us. Did I understand that wrong? Like, is that um, I don't think I said God needed to create us. Um, I would say I would say that love, in its very nature, is creative um, and wants to create things to experience that love. Yes. So it's it's a matter of choice, not of need. Good point. It's a good point, Paul. Any other questions? Over here. You're allowed to ask questions up the back too, you know. You don't have to just leave it to these people up the front. Although they did pay more for the seats, I understand. Uh, the whole fact that we fell as humans, was it a gradual thing? Like, are we still falling or was it just we fell and that's it? Are we still falling? Yes. Was it a once in a lifetime or once in an event? I believe yes but we keep replicating that event. We keep falling, you know, um, because of our, the fallen nature. Remember, we don't, we don't sin and therefore become sinners. We're sinners, therefore we sin. It's our fallen nature that has to be restored and then we've got to, as Father said, we've got to work ourselves, you know, through that. So we work out our salvation knowing that we can, as Paul says, you know, we're in conflict all the time. But yeah, I believe that, yeah, it was a, it was a big event, but we keep replaying it over in our own lives. There was a hand right in the back corner the there, back, yeah. lovely. We, we get the mic reach? back there. Will it reach or will it, you want to come forward and ask the question? Is your mic on? Sorry. Now can you hear me? Okay. You still can't hear me? Oh, I'm fine. That's oh, good. That's good. Me? Okay. Um, I just had a question regarding the passions versus the emotions. Yes. Um, I'm just. I just want to check. Was it that we had emotions in Eden, and then when we fell, that I mean, the passions. I, I'm a little bit confused. Sometimes I feel like. Um, for example, in Socrates, I think, or Plato, they'll talk about passions as emotions. Um, but I'm, from what you were saying, I think I understood passions to be desire rather than emotions. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, but they go hand in hand. I think if you have a, an emotionless desire, then um, you're in denial. Because most, I mean, most of our desires come from that, the, the where our our cognitions and our emotions meet. It's something that really ignites us, and we really desire it because it meets a need. Right. And those needs can be emotional needs. So the emotional 
normal needs that we would have had in heaven, or I suppose it would have been Eden then before the fall, they were not corrupted. Because no, before the fall, everything was in pristine order. Okay. Good so, stuff. And then once we've fallen, I mean, in terms of conflict, I'm trying to think of conflicting desires. How does that, I mean, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it better. Is that emotion, is, is the good desire emotion and the bad, bad desires passion? No. No. Passion is your desire with, a, with on speed, you know. Okay. But emotions don't have, there's no, there's no moral implication for emotion. Emotions are God's colour in a monochrome of life. Right. It's how you express the emotion that makes it a positive or negative thing. But, you know, you've got good emotions. Love is great. But if you have, if you have love, that means that you are committed to something because, and at your own risk, then it's become love that's really risky and dangerous for you. You know, and it can go into lust. If you really appreciate, um, say, the emotion of um, betrayal, right? If you take betrayal and act out seeking revenge, then betrayal has gone past being an emotion into being a negative action. Yeah. But if betrayal gets you to think about your expectations, your perceptions, your idealizations and devaluations of others and yourself, then it can be helpful. But, you, but if it's how you respond to, I mean, emotions are basically hormones and chemicals responding to cognitions. Mm. But if they then translate into negative action, then you've transgressed. Remember, Paul says, be angry, but don't sin. Mm. Right? So, depends on how you respond to the emotion. Okay. Thank you. But passion, you know, I mean... Passion's just um, going back to the colour thing, you know. Whereas, whereas emotions may be matte, um, passions gloss. Oh, I thought you had a question. You just came around. Okay, so oh, surprise. <laughs> Hello. What did he say? You know how you said um, you quoted that verse where, when um, so we have we can be angry but we shouldn't sin. Isn't anger a sin, or um, don't we Christians deem anger um, and the same way we handle lust and we handle um, um, I don't know all those seductive sexual thoughts? Isn't anger or feeling angry um, a sin? Not according to Paul, it says be angry but don't sin. Remember Martin Luther? Someone know who Martin Luther was? Okay. He said, you can't help the birds flying overhead, but you can stop them nesting in your hair. Right? In other words, you're going to have thoughts because you're a fallen human. Right? It's all part of the nature. But emotions, like, for example, anger. Let me, let me just do a bit of thing on anger here. <coughs> Real anger is rare. Anger is what I call an umbrella emotion. See, there are, there are emotions that empower you. There are emotions that disempower you, make you feel powerless and helpless. What happens is a person may feel embarrassed, belittled, ashamed, all those negative ones, they will put up an umbrella called anger because it empowers them. They feel, you know, indignant. They get angry. But they don't ever deal with what the real emotional pain is. 
But to actually be angry means, I mean, if Scripture talks about being angry. Jesus was angry, you know. But he was angry on behalf of those who couldn't be angry themselves or could not display that, you know. So there's very, very small window, I think, of genuine anger. Usually it's a defence against feeling powerless. So you empower yourself by getting angry or aggressive. But underneath, there's a lot more emotion going on. So anger itself is an emotion. It's how you respond to it determines whether it's positive or negative. I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I, well, thank um, you I very much. <laughs> no, I feel because... vindicated. <laughs> Uh, like I have been taught that it's so much easier and safer to be angry than to admit that you're hurt or that you're powerless. Well, it's safer, end. but it's long-term damage. Yes. yes. You keep anger stuffed in. It's what the Old Testament says are the roots of bitterness. You'll end up depressed and discouraged and, you know, it'll chew you away. Yeah. Okay, so, we've got a question at the back. You want to just... So can I double-check with my Orthodox... Um, like fellow Orthodox people, because I was taught that it's it's um, it's sinful to be angry or to feel even to feel anger, even if, even if you don't act upon it, you still have to confess that you've had angry thoughts or that you felt anger towards a person, and you still you have to confess that as a sin. So, is that true or false? <laughs> well, I think it depends what you're really feeling. You know, if you if you wish them dead, that's called hate. That's sinful. Because you wish that you were, they were dead, but anger is a different thing. Yes, I, I agree very much with pretty much everything that uh, Dr. Barker said. Uh, I think it's more something that your parents tell you that anger is a sin, because they don't like you being angry with them, so they convince you that it's actually a sin to get angry in general. But um, if you get angry because a, a defenseless grandma is being mugged in the street and you get angry and that motivates you to go and defend her, I think that's a very suitable anger. That's a very good thing to do. So really love is the question. Okay, Look at any emotion, any passion and ask, is it coming from love and acting in love? If it is, then it's good. If it isn't, if it's the opposite, selfish, then it becomes bad pretty much. Would, yeah. How will my action promote this person's well-being and sanctification. Another person, male in blue at the back there. We got a, You want to come forward, sir? Can we get the mic down? <laughs> what was that? What? What? I can't speak for the general population, but my impression is, listening to talkback radio, um, <laughs> that most people think that there's good in everyone. Whether that means they're intrinsically good <clears throat> is another question. But scripture says that at, underneath it all, we're pretty bad, you know. But we're redeemed, and that means that in God's eyes, we're clean. But we then have to make the walk match the actual stage, you know, status that we have. So, but I think that, yeah, most Christians believe that everybody's good because they're not willing to admit that they're bad. What's your second question? There's millions of them, but go on.
There's a lot of work being done at the moment. It's kind of the flavor of the month called attachment theory. And it talks about how it's important for a child to have both male and female attachments in their very early stages. Or it can produce a number of dysfunctional behaviors and thought patterns. I would say that before I would even hazard a guess as to the, the veracity of that statement that that psychologist made, I want to look at his presuppositions. Because anybody can put together a test trying to prove their hypothesis. Um, and because it's pretty hard to know what the quality of life was like for Nietzsche when he was a young boy or an infant. So I would say, yeah, he's probably just scratched the surface. I think it may have been a factor, but not the factor. You know, um, I think there's such a thing in, uh, in reality, as scripture would say, um, there are just some people who don't believe. Holy Spirit has not shaken them hard enough. They don't believe. And yes, attachment theory would say, and Freud said this, that our view of God is determined by our view of our Father. Because when our Father disappoints us, we then turn to a big Father who will never disappoint us. And he says, that's a fantasy. It's called the, the illusion. So I think somewhere in there, your psychologist has got a little mixed up with the realities. Ladies, you'll have to fight over who's going to go first. That wouldn't be very Christian, but go by age. <laughs> uh, I'm, okay, self-disclosure, I'm an atheist. Uh, and I'd just like to address, sorry, uh, yeah, I'd just like to say uh, I have a really good relationship with my father for some anecdotal evidence just there. Um, and a question to you is that uh, are there any, um, what, what is the unique kind of issues that come about for people of faith versus people who don't have faith in terms of mental illness? Like, I know that you said um, that there was a study that you quoted about how people of faith are, uh, uh, you know, recover quicker. Um, but I'd like to know if there are any, um, you know, contributing factors that uh, might differentiate. For example, um, uh, things like thought suppression. Uh, it, it came out before that, you know, thoughts of anger or thoughts of lust, for example. Um, someone who is of faith, who is religious, um, would you know see that as a really bad thing if they saw someone and felt lustful, for example. Uh, as an atheist, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I, but so I don't get that guilt, and I'd like to know if there are any mental illness issues such as that that you that kind of differentiate people of faith who versus people who don't have faith. Well, there's no research that differentiates between believers and non-believers as to the, um, the frequency or the volume of mental illness in those areas. But there tends to be some specificity within them. Like it's very rare for an atheist to have religious delusions, right? But they're quite common in, in the Christian realm or the faith realm. And it's, quite, it's, it's not as rare, but in the non-believing realm, the existential despair issues that often result in depression and, um, and high anxiety tend to be more dominant within the non-faith community because they don't have a faith anchor in that. So there's um, th those issues of existential angst and, and, and lack of... of um, of anchorage. But there's nothing 
that's going to be conclusive on that. The, the figures tend to split pretty much the same. Um, the one that used to stand out was that um, Christian marriages were far more st stronger than non-Christian marriages. That's a myth. Um, in you know, percentage-wise, um, there's more divorces amongst the Christians than there is amongst the rest of the population. So I, I don't think mental illness discriminates on faith. But there are factors like existential hopelessness or whatever that do perhaps um, predispose somebody to certain uh, problems that are related to their lack of or, or faith-based life. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, glad to have that question. Yes, the lady has preference here. Just hang on. Yeah, I've just got a very quick question. Um, when when we go through the characters of the Bible, um, it's not uncommon to, for example, read that um, King David himself has gone through some kind of um, depression or anxiety himself. Would we all agree with that? Or? Oh, and absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I specifically am referring to Psalm 13 where he directs his um, energy towards God and he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Yeah. So that sense of abandonment is not coming from anger, perhaps from the people around or um, you know, the circumstances as such because he's a man of great faith. So my question is, how would you counsel someone in the church, a practicing Christian, who, who is waiting on God and he feels that same sense that of abandonment that King David has felt when he cries out to the Lord, how long, O Lord, will, have you, will you forget me? How long shall I have sorrow in my heart daily? So that is someone that's going through the motions of feeling abandoned by God. Good question. I think I'd do the same thing as if it was David or anybody. I think I'd want to know the context. You know, I mean, he was also in a position where his, his mentor, his king, was tracking him down, wanting to kill him. You know, so there's a lot of factors that kind of like, well, God, where are you? You've abandoned me when I need you most. And some people do that. It's like, why have I got this medical problem? Or Elijah, hey, I've been working my butt off for you. How come you've left me alone? So I think you've got to work on... One, what's their, what's their real expectation here? You know, what is it that's really at the core? Is it the sense that God has abandoned them? Or have they become such narrow focus because of their depression that they don't see the, that there's a bigger picture? So I'd be looking at context, the factors that have brought a person in, and just like Elijah, I'd be looking at, okay, what needs to happen? You know, what needs to happen for David to actually move through those phases of physical, emotional, cognitive change? And it comes back to the relationship that I will have with my client. Because it's very hard to have a close relationship with a pillar of fire or a, or a smoke. It's a person. And that's why there's the incarnation. And so I think you have to be, in the case, in this case with this person that comes, you have to be incarnationally Jesus. So you have to be present, you have to be able to share with them their pain and contain it. So that's where I would start, but I'd want to know the context. Thank you, thank you, that's, yeah. that's great, thank you. Because it doesn't happen in a vacuum. I think there was. Um, just back onto that um, thing about um, marriage breakdowns that you're talking about before. You said that there's more Christian marriages that fall apart than um, you know people who you know are non you know that percentage wise. Percentage wise, yeah. does that take into account whether these people are actually you know, devout practicing uh, Christians or whether they're just, you know, in a sense, 
you know, for lack of a better term, hypocrites, where they, you know, they say they're Christian, but they're they're really not. Because I think this is worth cons this will be worth considering um, when you're trying to work out, you know, how do you determine, you know, proper from well, proper Well, there's sort of no there's no way of knowing by interview or by checklist a person's truthfulness as to the you know the state of their their Christian faith. No, this was um, basically census material. Oh, okay. You know, what is your faith? And it was divided by denomination. This is a US study. So there was, you know, 2,003 varieties of Baptist and all the rest of it. Um, but then their, their status of whether they were divorced, recently divorced, never married, whatever. So they were the stats. That, I mean, it was someone's doctoral thesis that began this, oh. but that's how it, that's how they came up with this. That it was a myth to say that a person, because they're Christian, is immune from marital stress and, and divorce. But I would concur from my clinical experience. Most of the people that came to see me for marriage therapy, the majority—I mean, the majority of them were Christian. And the majority of them came just to have the coffin nailed down. They weren't really interested in reconciliation. A number were, but the majority weren't. They just went through the motions. It was very frustrating for moi. <laughs> uh, thank okay, you. We've got a question. we got a, an answer. Can I just uh, definitely in Australia? Um, I mean, the, the marriage rate it's starting to climb, but it's climbing from very low figures. Um, it's not socially um, unacceptable like it used to be in the you know through the seventies. That was last century, by the way. Um, so I think that that has to be a factor that there's the the pressure to get married but the other thing is a lot of non-christians or rather a lot of Christians aren't getting married either they're just shacking up so a solid Christian faith really isn't essential to a am I speaking into this probably um, it's not really essential to a you know happy healthy marriage that sort of thing if a person is a practicing Christian, right, they're really renewed and their life is committed to serving their partner, to seeing them grow and enhance their life, if they're committed to Christian faith and to a Christian marriage, I think they've got far more opportunity and sustainability to go through the rough patches. Because instead of just saying, right, I'm out of here, you know, um, I'll go and find someone else, there is that idea that God has a purpose and a plan for that marriage. So I think if a person is, is a practicing and really committed Christian, um, there are ways that that marriage can be worked out. See, I come back to something that's really basic here and this is my psychodynamic coming out, children act out their emotions. Adults discuss them and work them out. A child you know, picks up their toy or their cricket stumps and they go home. But an adult works it out because they know that there was something there, something's gone wrong, we can change it. But it's increasingly evident that that's not the pathway that people are choosing, increasingly. Thank you. You want to pick that up or shout? Can we get hands up please, sorry. Uh, just the process of restoration. We were just talking before in the beginning about 
you know, the fall and the return and yeah. the change of oneself and all that. But isn't that the same thing with the with marriage? If it's a process of restoring, isn't marriage supposed to be a reflection of God's love with humanity? So is the man to his wife, or and so forth. That it's more of a reflection. So that there is, if there was any hiccups, there's all a process of re, uh, restoration, and that's what Absolutely. should be seen in the Christian family. Yeah. So it really comes back to those Christians, especially those ones that were surveyed. How well do they know? You know, this whole idea of Christ comes to redeem a process of restoring, a process of change, a process of growth, is that really there? So is it a matter of Christians not, or is it a matter of how well do these Christians know, you know, the, 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 the salvation and well, the person of yeah, Christ? And I think you've, the, the one factor that you're not mentioning is what often is the critical factor here, is that people that are hurt and feel betrayed or feel disrespected or feel as though they've lost their dignity or someone's denied them their dignity out of that deep and strongly felt emotion, they will act and make decisions that will override their belief system. You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's typical adolescent stuff. I mean, an adolescent's behaviour the majority of an adolescent's behaviour will be influenced by peers rather than their belief system. You know, until they move back a bit and start to think about it. And that's why with, with couples, in the heat of the a moment, they will separate, they'll say things that are terrible and destroy the other person because they're hurt. And part of the restoration process is to be able to get them to separate out their feelings on that particular moment, that particular issue, for the bigger picture that says, hey, we can work through this, we've committed to this, this is a road bump, it's not a brick wall. So, yes, but you've got to remember there's an emotional issue always involved in this. People feel hurt and they want out or they want revenge or they want, you know, um, okay, and then based on that, that re question I asked much earlier about relation, um, the relationship between belief and experience. Yeah. So if one has a, a true experience of God, their belief system would then really kick in, I would say, most of the time or should be all the time. Yeah. And, and on that point, isn't that through that sacramental life where we mentioned earlier baptism yeah. and repentance? But, and but if, if they're really in touch with all that, they shouldn't get themselves in a position where they've aggravated or betrayed their spouse to the point where there's an action taken like separation or divorce or abuse, you know. Um, so, yes, so that at some point that party has departed from their basic core beliefs and functionality. And that's the problem, to get them to admit that. Mm. Okay. Excuse oh, me, sorry. We've got about a few minutes Relationships left. Relationships are the most difficult thing, you know? They're the most difficult thing. We get on fine, you know, um, when we're in the car by ourselves and we're travelling along, we've got our music playing, but as soon as another person gets on our road, what happens? You know? No, we're very egocentric and we always bring that into our relationships. We got one more question here. We've got about two minutes left, so can we just have the last question. Well, anybody so got a question they can answer in two there's minutes? A question right there, right there. The gentleman up here. <laughs> down there, down there, sorry. Sorry. Um, the title of this, uh, or the subtitle of this uh, talk was, Is Depression a Sin? Um, I'm not going to, that's not the question I'm going to ask you. It's more of a question that's already been, uh, was uh, already raised by, I forgot your name. Does Christianity uh, stigmatize mental illness or does it make stigma and does that, or does it contribute to delusions that uh, susceptible people uh, can build upon and manifest as a mental illness? and? Are these delusions that they uh, make? Um, you know, you got four questions so far. Okay. 
Can we go back to the first one? Yeah. Christianity is a broad church. And most of the work to do in healing and bringing health into mental illness has been Christian driven. All right? The father of psychiatry, Johann August Christian Heinroth, you know, was a, was a great Christian believer. Um, so it's, it hasn't always been that way, and most Christians have got a real compassion for those that have mental illness. The problem is ignorance breeds fear. And most people, whether they're Christian or not, don't know what mental illness is about. You see someone in a wheelchair with MS or something really severe and they're, they're sitting on the side of the road, how many people stop and talk? They don't want to be reminded of the pain in this world. They will go by, they'll start to read a book upside down or they'll cross the road. That's a person who probably would appreciate just someone saying, you know, hey, how's things today? Mental illness, you know, most of it is locked away. You don't see it. But it's not contagious. And yes, I think our churches are re greatly remiss about not reaching out to the handicapped in any form, whether that intellectual or physical or any sort of mental illness. I think we are far from what Jesus would want us to do. So yes, I think w there is a go away mentality, not in my church, thank you very much, that predominates. We'll have to stop it there. Thank okay. you very much. Can I say thank you for the invitation, Father Antonio, for your participation, for Paul's contribution? He's been emailing me daily for two weeks. Um, but thank you. A, this has been a, a great time. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'll just conclude very briefly. Um, we've, we've been through quite a bit. We've started at the beginning of creation. Love is creative, so it decides to create something in its own image. That thing falls down um, and is no longer with that love. And then there are problems. And then that same love comes down to rescue it and bring it back to where it was. Uh, certainly, you can be a Christian and uh, study psychology. Certainly, Christianity and psychology don't seem to have any major um, disagreements. Certainly, they work hand in hand, as we have seen. Um, and as we Christians would even say that Christianity puts psychology in the right context. Um, that is all for tonight. Dr. Graham has just informed me that his slides will be up on the apologetics page. Please check the page out on Facebook. I think it's Coptic Apologetics Group. Coptic Apologetics Discussion Group. Just search on that for fa on Facebook. There's lots of discussion there. And we you can continue some of the things that we've begun here. I'm sorry if your, answers, your questions weren't answered, but we've had to, uh, we've had to draw up. Can I ask Gabona to uh, conclude with a prayer, please? Uh, just before we conclude, uh, we have a very small present to give to Dr. Barker to say thank you very much for coming. I'm just saying it was wonderful having um, someone who's an expert in his area of Christian psychology to come and be among us and to answer our questions. I'm not sure how quickly he has to rush off tonight uh, and whether he may have a little bit of time to answer sort of individual questions or... Oh, okay. Well, we, we don't want to break the visa conditions. <laughs> but thank you very much for being with us. And uh, I'd like to add my thanks to Paul, who has worked very, very hard and done, put a lot of effort into this. And uh, I think you'd agree it was, it's been a very enjoyable night. And, and thank you for his efforts as well. 
Um, a couple of very quick housekeeping things. Um, number one, just a, a comment I'll just quickly add to something that was mentioned earlier, just a distinction between the sort of Eastern and Western perception of human nature, which was a question that was asked. Um, I think in the East we tend to have a more positive view of, of uh, human nature uh, than the West. Basically that humans are basically good, but they're a bit broken and they need to sort of get that brokenness fixed, but the goodness is the basic things. Uh, it may be just a difference of emphasis, but I thought I'd point out that difference uh, quickly. Next uh, month, our topic is miracles. Um, those of you who are not uh, orthodox may be unaware that we didn't actually celebrate Easter today because we still have an old calendar, and according to that old calendar, well, we celebrate it actually um, in about five weeks time. What that means is the last Sunday of April is going to be our Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday in the Coptic Church means basically spending the day at church. So next Sunday, the 28th, which is the normal time we would have had the apologetics meeting, we will, well, this church is going to be filled with people singing lots of, palm, well, you know, Lenten tunes and things like that. You are most welcome to come along, of course, you know, the doors are always open. But our apologetics meeting will be moved back by one Sunday. So we couldn't do it this next Sunday because that is our Easter. So we will be doing it on the 21st of April. Uh, if you run according to a, you know, routine, please make that little correction in your routine. I'm sure there will be stuff on the Facebook page as well to remind you and so on. So the next meeting won't be the 28th, it will be the 21st of April. It will be about miracles. We'll be asking, do they exist? Are they real? Are they delusions or hallucinations? Are they aliens perhaps? Who knows? Um, if miracles do exist, do they prove the existence of God or do they not really prove the existence of God? Maybe which God do they prove? And so on. As you can see, there will be a lot of very interesting questions to answer. Well, we hope to answer. We'll certainly ask them. Um, we are trying to get a couple of people who have actually witnessed miracles to be with us so we can grill them as well and see what's really going on here. So it promises to be another interesting one. Uh, I hope you have a lovely month and we'll look forward to seeing you the next time. If we could please all stand up for our final prayer. Hear us our Lord as we pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power and glory forevermore. Amen. Thank you all. And have a lovely public holiday tomorrow. Nobody go to work because you forgot. <laughs>